So my name is Stephen Smith Fleury. I work at the SME Assist uh, in the SME Assist team here at the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Uh, just before we do start today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we meet today, uh, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect and acknowledgement to any uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. So just a disclaimer before we do start. So uh, please just note that these slides are a summary only uh, and that they shouldn't be taken as law or policy. So today's training session uh, will consist of a, a few different parts. So part one will cover the basics of therapeutic goods regulation. Uh, so this will provide an overview on how therapeutic goods are regulated, uh, what we do at the TGA, uh, and we'll cover some terms uh, that you'll need to know and also where to find help if you need it. Uh, part two will cover supplying medicinal cannabis. So this is where we'll look at that sort of specialised um, part uh, of today's workshop. Uh, we'll cover supplies of prescription and over-the-counter medicine. Uh, and we'll also hear about both the TGA and Office of Drug Control's requirements on manufacturing and importing. Uh, from there, we'll have a short break uh, and then we'll be back for part three. Uh, which is a Q&A session with TGA experts, uh, and we'll uh, spend an hour uh, in that Q&A. So, as I said, we will start with the basics of therapeutic goods regulation, uh, where I'll give you general information about uh, the therapeutic uh, goods regulation in Australia, uh, the role of the TGA, TGA's SME Assist Service, uh, and how to supply medicinal cannabis in Australia. Also uh, point you in the direction of where you uh, can find some help if you do need it. So we do understand that therapeutic goods regulation can be challenging to navigate. Uh, we provide the SME assist service at the TGA to help small and medium enterprises, startups, researchers, uh, and anybody basically who's unfamiliar with therapeutic goods regulation uh, to understand their responsibilities when it comes to supplying therapeutic goods. So our team runs workshops which cover the basics of regulation, uh, market authorization, manufacturing, advertising, and post-market monitoring. So we do have recorded, uh, we have recorded, sorry, and published some of our live streamed workshops uh, and also have pre-recorded material available for you. So you can find all of this on the TGA website under educational videos uh, or on the SME Assist Hub of the TGA website too. Uh, we do have a range of interactive decision tools to help with decision making uh, when it comes to supplying therapeutic goods. Uh, so these include, uh, is my product a therapeutic good? So um, just as it, as, as it sounds, that decision tool will help you determine whether or not your product is a therapeutic good or not. Uh, and another uh, tool that we do have available amongst others uh, is what classification is my medical de device in case you're looking at supplying a device. Uh, so we do encourage you to subscribe to our SME Assist email list uh, to stay up to date with the latest SME information, including any upcoming workshops, new guidance and webinars. Uh, I will mention here also that we have recently released a series of uh, five podcasts uh, just around um, therapeutic goods regulation. We cover things like what happens in the laboratories, uh, advertising of therapeutic goods and manufacturing, amongst other things. Uh, so you can find that podcast uh, wherever you listen to your podcasts. It's available on all platforms now, also on the TGA website. So we'll start now with the basics of therapeutic goods regulation. So first we'll have a look at the TGA, uh, of course, who we are and what we do. So we are a part of the Australian Government Department of Health. Uh, we regulate and monitor all therapeutic goods to ensure that they're safe, uh, of good quality, and do what they're supposed to do. We do this in line with the Therapeutic Goods Act, which provides a uniform national system of controls over therapeutic goods. Uh, and, and this system, of course, uh, is a benefit to both consumers and industry. Uh, now, when we're looking at what a therapeutic goods, uh, uh, what a therapeutic good is, sorry, uh, what do we mean by therapeutic good? Uh, so, a therapeutic good is broadly defined as something that's used for preventing, diagnosing, 
curing or alleviating a disease, ailment, defect or injury. So for example, a, a medicine like paracetamol, uh, a therapeutic good may influence, inhibit or modify physiolo uh, physiology. Uh, so for example, a pacemaker, uh, it could uh, be used to test for a disease or ailment. So something like an MRI machine potentially. Uh, it can influence, control or prevent conception. Uh, for example, a condom. Uh, it can test for pregnancy, so a pregnancy test. Uh, it could also replace or modify a part of the anatomy. So for example, a prosthesis. Uh, again, we do have those decision tools available on, on our uh, SME Assist webpage to help you determine if your product is a therapeutic good. Uh, and again, in the case of a device, um, the classification that it might be. So therapeutic goods generally fall under three categories. Uh, we're looking at medicines, biologicals, uh, and of course, medical devices. Uh, first, we'll have a look at uh, medicines. So within that space, we've got prescription medicines like antibiotics, uh, and these require a doctor's prescription. We've got complementary medicines which contain herbs, vitamins, minerals, nutritional supplements, homeopathic and certain aromatherapy preparations. Uh, so for example, here we might be looking at multivitamins, some herbal teas, and also potentially some essential oils. Uh, and then we've also got over-the-counter medicines. So these can be purchased without a prescription uh, and they're also not considered complementary medicines. So they include things like uh, some lozenges uh, and also some cold and flu tablets. So medicines uh, also include things like vaccines, blood and plasma. Uh, the second category, category we'll have a look here are uh, biologicals which are things that are made from or contain human, cell, uh, human cells or tissues uh, or live animal cells, tissues or organs. An example might be a skin graft between patients. Uh, and finally, we have medical devices. So they have a physical or mechanical effect on the body and are used to measure or uh, monitor bodily functions. So they can include things like uh, surgical tools, uh, appliances like pacemakers, and materials like sterile bandages. So it's also important to know what the TGA doesn't regulate. So we don't regulate veterinary medicines, uh, we don't regulate health professionals uh, or health insurance, uh, we don't regulate food standards, uh, and we don't regulate cosmetic and chemical standards. So these are regulated by other federal or state, state and territory bodies. Uh, you can see some of those here on this slide. Um, do note that some cosmetics used in surgery, so for example, uh, things like breast implants and cosmetic injectables are actually regulated by the TGA. And it's also worth noting uh, as we do sometimes interact with other regulators. Uh, so if you do work with us, you may also need to work with other, other regulators. So at the TGA, we also, we don't uh, research or develop new therapeutic goods. Uh, we don't provide clinical advice to individuals or consider cost effectiveness uh, or recommend one product over another. Uh, and we don't make decisions about subsidies of therapeutic goods. Uh, here we have an overview of the therapeutic good development life, uh, development life cycle, sorry, to show you how the different stages do fit together. Uh, so first, if you're looking at uh, conducting a clinical trial, you design and get approval to run that trial. Uh, then you'd use, um, you'd get approval to use your unapproved product in the trial. Uh, and then you'd also seek approval to supply your product after that. So that's known as market authorization. Um, and then after that, you'd, or during that, you'd also uh, potentially uh, look at possible subsidization of your product. So here you can see that the TGA is responsible for uh, the use of your unapproved product in a clinical trial uh, and approving the supply of your product. So you can see that in the blue boxes here. Uh, TGA isn't responsible for designing clinical trials or subsidising therapeutic goods. 
Uh, so you can see those things in the green boxes here. Uh, and I'll just note that subsidisation is carried out by our colleagues over at um, the broader Department of Health. Uh, for some products, you may be able to make applications to the department for subsidy uh, in parallel with your application to the TGA for market authorisation. Uh, however, no pharmaceutical prosthesis or Medicare listing uh, will occur until the product is actually included on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods or ARTG. So for more information around this, uh, you can contact the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme or have a look at their website. Uh, you can also check the Prosthesis List Advisory Committee website or the Medical Services Advisory Committee website. Uh, and, and do remember that TGA approval doesn't necessarily mean that your product will be subsidised. Um, now we might just move on now and have a bit more of a look, a closer look at clinical trials. Uh, and our involvement there. So in Australia, the clinical trial environment is quite broad. Uh, clinical trials conducted here are subject to various regulatory controls uh, to ensure the safety of participants. All clinical trials uh, require ethics approval before they can commence. Uh, and trials that do involve the use of unapproved therapeutic goods are also subject to TGA requirements. While the TGA is not heavily involved in clinical trials, there are two pathways for accessing unapproved therapeutic goods for experimental purposes. Uh, first of all, the notification process called the CTN scheme, and this is for lower risk products. Uh, and then for some high risk or novel treatments such as gene therapy, we've got the approval process, which is called the CTA scheme. Uh, the use of unapproved therapeutic goods in a clinical trial must be in accordance with national and international guidelines and, of course, the protocol approved by the relevant uh, Human Research Ethics Committee. So our Australian Clinical Trial Handbook provides guidance on requirements when uh, conducting clinical trials using unapproved therapeutic goods. So it does help those involved to understand their roles and responsibilities under our legislation. Uh, and you can see more information on the responsibilities outside of TGA requirements uh, if you visit the National Health and Medical Research Council Australian Clinical Trials website. Uh, so for any further information or clarification on our Australian Clinical Trial Handbook, uh, you can always uh, get in touch with us via telephone or email. So we'll move on now to market authorization. So market authorization is required, of course, before you can supply a therapeutic good in Australia. Uh, when we look at supply, we're not just looking at selling a product. So supply is the sale, exchange, gift, lease, loan, hire or higher purchase of the product. So we're looking at things here like potentially a free sample, uh, the leasing of a dentist drill, hiring out crutches, all of those things um, and all of those activities would need uh, market authorization. Uh, now, if you want to manufacture, import, export or arrange for the import, export or manufacture of therapeutic goods, you will need to apply for market authorization. When authorization is granted, uh, the product would be added to the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods or ARTG. So I have mentioned this a couple of times already. The ARTG is an online database on the TGA website where you can search using keywords. Uh, so you could potentially search for a product name, an active ingredient, uh, a sponsor name as well. Um, there's a number of search terms that you can use. Uh, it is a good idea if you are applying for market authorization that you do search the ARTG to see, uh, see similar products that are being supplied. Now, each ARTG entry is unique in some way, uh, or as we call it, separate and distinct. So this uniqueness depends on the type of therapeutic good you have. Um, you can see here, and you will have received uh, the slides for today, you can go to the relevant links here uh, and have a look at the definition in the legislation that's relevant to your product. Uh, for now, we'll just have a look at a high-risk prescription medicine as an example. 
So if we have another medicine that is exactly the same, but has a different name, a different indication or different dosage, that product would be considered separate and distinct. And it'll have its own ARTG entry in that case. But if it has just a, a different pack size, pack size, sorry, for instance, uh, so for example, 12, uh, 12 pack of tablets versus a 36 pack of tablets, um, it's not considered separate, separate and distinct. Uh, and an, a separate ARTG entry uh, would not be required in that case. Okay, so when we uh, are assessing your product for market authorization approval, we do use a benefit versus risk approach. So goods that do pose a higher risk of adverse events uh, or are used for more serious diseases like prescription medicines are more tightly regulated than those that pose a lower risk like herbal supplements. Each therapeutic good will have different degrees uh, of benefit and risk, but in all cases, benefits must outweigh, outweigh the risks. So we'll have a look at uh, benefit versus risk in the context of, of medicines here. So as you can see, medicines are considered uh, low or high risk, depending on the claims made about the medicine, what it contains, the benefits and risks associated with it. Uh, in Australia, lower risk and higher risk medicines are given particular names. So lower risk medicines are called listed medicines. Higher risk medicines are called registered medicines. Uh, and anything in between those are called assessed listed medicines. So the take home message here, I guess, is that higher risk uh, registered medicines do require more rigorous pre-market evaluation. Now, our work at the TGA is ongoing. Uh, it does continue over the lifetime of every therapeutic good uh, from manufacturing through to adverse events. Our regulatory compliance functions do support consumer protection and enable a fair market for industry. We monitor and enforce where necessary compliance with legislation regulations and rules for therapeutic goods. We do promote high levels of voluntary compliance through engagement and education as well. Now, all types of therapeutic goods do have their own Australian regulatory guidelines to assist applicants and sponsors with the process of applying for market authorization. So these are listed on the slide here, as you can see. Um, do note that they are guidance documents only. Uh, but you can access them through the links shown on the slides. Uh, if you do access them and need any help with them, uh, if you um, I'm not sure what something means in there, you're more than welcome to give us a call here uh, or of course, pop us an email. So the Australian regulatory guidelines are located in the industry tab on the TGA website. The different types of therapeutic goods are listed underneath, uh, as you can see. Here, you select the standards and guidelines, uh, and then you'll find the relevant guidelines for the type of products that you're looking at supplying. So you can see there, we've got prescription medicines, over-the-counter medicines, complementary medicines, as well as sunscreens, medical devices, and so on. Now, the TGA Business Services is where you'll submit and manage your applications. Uh, so every sponsor does need an account uh, for the TGA Business Services uh, portal. Uh, and you would create an account by completing an organisation details form, which you can find on the TGA website. Uh, you complete that form and send it back to the email address uh, on the form itself. Uh, if you do need any help with it at all, again, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us here. So fees and charges, we do cover costs through fees and charges for activities that fall within the scope of the Therapeutic Goods Act. So as a sponsor of a therapeutic good, you will be required to pay fees and charges that apply to your good. Fees are for a service, while charges, of course, are an annual tax. All therapeutic goods on the ARTG are subject to annual charges, except for export-only products and products that fall under the annual charge exemption scheme. So we do encourage you to have a look at the link uh, to fees and charges so that you do know what to expect. Now, I did mention the annual charge exemption or ACE scheme. 
So this allows for the exemption of annual charges until a product first generates turnover. So all new entries on the ARTG are eligible and sponsors would need to make a declaration each year confirming zero dollars turnover. So we do note that fees are not included in the annual charge exemption scheme, only charges. And I will just note here also, um, if you do have a product that doesn't make turnover in the first couple of years and then it does, um, you'd no longer be eligible for the ACE scheme, even if in the future it doesn't make, um, generate turnover. So uh, the SME Assist Hub, uh, so you can find a range of information on the SME Assist Hub under the industry section of the TGA website. So um, as you can see here, you can click on that um, section on the front page there. You can also go to the industry tab uh, of the TGA website and you'll see SME Assist uh, at the top of the page there. Okay, so we'll now uh, take you through some of the aspects of supplying medicinal cannabis in Australia. So please do note that we will briefly cover uh, access to unapproved medicinal cannabis products, but our focus will be on domestic supply of products included in the ARTG and the pathways through which this can be done. As we've already learned, all therapeutic goods, unless exempt or excluded, must be included in the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods before import into, export from or supply in Australia. So this includes medicinal cannabis products uh, when for general supply in the marketplace. There are also particular circumstances in which approval is granted for the use of unapproved products uh, and we'll touch on that now. So medicines that are not included on the ARTG are known as unapproved medicines. Uh, now, with these products, it is really important to note uh, that the TGA has not evaluated them uh, for safety or efficacy. Uh, now, as far as accessing these goods, any uh, Australian medical practitioner can apply to supply these products via the Special Access Scheme or SAS or the Authorised Prescriber Scheme. Uh, so the Authorised Prescriber uh, Scheme, under that scheme, medical practitioners can apply uh, to supply a specific unapproved med medicinal cannabis product uh, to specific patients with, uh, patients with a particular medicinal condition or symptom. Um, as far as the uh, Special Access Scheme, um, medical professionals can apply to uh, prescribe these products um, for any um, particular indication. Uh, so as far as actually making application, health professionals uh, would lodge their special access scheme application uh, or, th or authorised prescriber scheme application uh, through the online SAS or authorised prescriber uh, online system. Um, now, they may need to also make application to relevant state or territory health departments, uh, but we do have an arrangement in place with the online portal now um, where we can um, submit those uh, in, in tandem. So anyone supplying medicinal cannabis through these schemes, uh, so what would be known as a sponsor, is responsible for meeting their regulatory requirements. Uh, now, this would include the submission of the TGO 93 declaration form. Uh, so the Therapeutic Goods Order 93 or TGO 93 uh, is a standard that specifies minimum quality requirements uh, for medicinal cannabis products. Uh, so that would need to be uh, submitted uh, to the TGO. Uh, so more information about these process, processes um, is available on the TGA website. Uh, or you can contact, um, contact us by telephone uh, or email again. Uh, the government's ultimate goal is to have a, a wider range of medicinal cannabis products included in the ARTG uh, as registered medicines. So we're now going to move on to a general supply of medicinal cannabis for those products requiring inclusion on the ARTG.
So first of all, um, our first stop, of course, is to look at the scheduling of products. Uh, so scheduling of medicines plays an important role when supplying medicinal cannabis. Uh, the poison standard has been uh, developed to ensure the safe handling of substances in Australia. It does provide a uniform approach to control the availability and accessibility of substances that can be used as ingredients in medicines, uh, as well as cosmetics, agricultural products or household cleaners. So it also includes provisions about containers uh, and labels with a view to promoting uniform labelling and packaging requirements through Australia. So the poison standard is given legal effect uh, through state and territory legislation. Uh, it's also known as the standard for uniform scheduling of medicines and poisons or SUSMP. So um, yeah, as I said, the different states and territories um, may give that different legal effect and it's always good to check. So, so uh, medicines and poisons are classified into schedules as shown here on the slide. Uh, so for our purposes, we're looking at schedule three, which is uh, for a pharmacist only medicine. Schedule four is prescription only medicine and schedule eight is for controlled drugs. So you can find more information about scheduling on the TGA website uh, and we do have a link uh, in the slides today. Um, again, you can contact us if you need assistance. Uh, so if we look at cannabis and the cannabis uh, scheduling, uh, it does, uh, cannabis and its derivatives do appear in uh, schedules three, four, eight and nine of the poison standard. So for our purposes today, though, we'll be looking at uh, schedules three, four and eight uh, as schedule nine substances uh, cannot be used in therapeutic goods. Uh, so the first things that we'll look at here are cannabis and tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. Uh, so as you can see from the slide here, under certain circumstances, cannabis uh, and THC are controlled drugs uh, and appear under Schedule 8 of the poison standard uh, when prepared or packed for human therapeutic use. So access will need to be confirmed uh, with relevant state and territories. Uh, as this can vary between uh, jurisdictions. So the next uh, substance that we'll have a look at here is cannabidiol or CBD. Uh, so cannabidiol or CBD uh, can appear in uh, schedules four or three. Uh, so for the uh, schedule four uh, entry, it is in preparations for therapeutic use uh, or analytical and scientific research uh, when it comprises of 98% uh, or more of the total cannabinoid content of the preparation. Uh, and of course, if any cannabinoid other than cannabidiol, um, it must only, uh, sorry, cannabidiol, any other cannabinoid, sorry, I'm losing my words here, uh, must only be those found uh, naturally in cannabis and comprise of 2% or less uh, of the total cannabinoid content of that preparation. Uh, so uh, it would not be included schedule four uh, when it's included in schedule, schedule three. And we'll have a look at that now. So uh, a schedule three uh, entry for, for CBD or cannabidiol uh, is a low dose CBD uh, entry. So it is for uh, oral, oral, oral mucosal and sublingual preparations included in the ARTG. Uh, when the cannabidiol is either plant derived or when synthetic only contains a certain anatomy. Uh, and of course the cannabidiol comprises 98% or more of the total cannabinoid content. And um, there's a couple of other uh, requirements there, including specific restrictions on dose, packaging, pack size, uh, and intended users. So um, I'd, I'd suggest having a look at the poison standard or SUSMP. Uh, just to have a look at the different entries there, uh, if you are looking at supplying a product to see where your product might sit. Um, we do have other substances as well. Uh, so uh, as you can see on the slide here, we do have nabixamols, uh, nabilone and uh, dronabinol, which are listed as controlled drugs as well. So that's uh, Schedule 8 of the poison standard. Uh, so any Schedule 8 uh, 
controlled drug does require a prescription from an Australian registered medical uh, practitioner. Uh, and there may be uh, certain uh, state or territory requirements as well. So we'll move on to manufacturing requirements. So first of all, we'll take a look at the TGA manufacturing requirements uh, under the Therapeutic Goods Act, which are different to the requirements of the Office of Drug Control, uh, which we will cover a, a bit later. So therapeutic goods must be manufactured by a TGA approved manufacturer. Uh, when we look at manufacture, we're looking at uh, anything from packaging, labeling, processing, testing, uh, release for uh, supply and some other steps uh, that are listed on the slide here. Um, all manufacturers must comply with the principles of good, manu uh, good manufacturing practice or GMP. Uh, so that's a term that you'll hear quite often. Uh, now, GMP or good manufacturing practice describes a set of principles and procedures which when followed by a manufacturer of therapeutic goods uh, helps to ensure that each batch of a therapeutic good is safe, reliable, and of consistent high quality. So manufacturers must obtain a GMP license or clearance for the manufacturing steps uh, that they perform and also the type of medicine. The TGA website, which includes a step-by-step -step guide around manufacturing medicines, um, and you can also refer to the decision uh, tool on the SME Assist Hub. So this can help you in determine whether you're looking at um, requiring GMP licensing or certification. Um, and we'll go into uh, the different types of requirements now. So there are different processes that apply for obtaining approval from manufacturers in Australia compared to overseas. So if your manufacturer is located in Australia, they'll need to obtain a GMP license from the TGA. They'll have to submit a GMP application to us with the details about their manufacturing sites uh, and their manufacturing steps. So this would involve an on-site inspection. Uh, and after the inspection and um, after the applications are assessed, if a license is granted, uh, the manufacturer would then forward this license, these license details through to the sponsor uh, for them to include, their, um, include in their market authorization application. So at the end of the day, the sponsor is considered responsible for ensuring that their manufacturer does have a GMP license. Uh, it is important to note as well that manufacturing inspections can happen, happen at any time uh, during the market authorization process to ensure compliance. Now, if your manufacturer is located overseas, uh, it would be the, the, the sponsor's responsibility to ensure that they have GMP clearance uh, as opposed to a GMP license. So we do have various uh, international agreements and arrangements with other countries and jurisdictions. Uh, these are called mutual recognition agreements or MRAs. Uh, now for medicines and biologicals, there are around 25 countries uh, that we do have an MRA with or an equivalent arrangement uh, with Australia. You can find a list of these um, countries on the TGA website. Uh, so do have a look there. Again, if you uh, need any assistance or um, guidance there, you can always get in touch with us. Now, again, if your manufacturer is located overseas, you do have a few options as far as uh, obtaining GMP clearance. So the first, of course, would be the Mutual Recognition Agreement or MRA pathway, uh, which you could use if your manufacturing site is within the borders of an MRA country uh, and your site has been inspected by that country's regulatory authority. The second would be the Compliance Verification Pathway, which you could use if the manufacturer doesn't meet criteria for MRA and the site has been inspected by an MRA regulatory authority. Uh, and the third and final would be the GMP certification pathway. So you could use this pathway if the MRA or CV pathways are not applicable, or if there's no acceptable evidence from a recognised regulatory authority available. So this pathway um, may also involve an on-site inspection by one of our GMP inspectors. Now, the GMP clearance application 
uh, assistance tool on the SME Assist Hub will help you determine the general evidence requirements uh, for your GMP application. Uh, so if you go to the TGA website, again under uh, Industry and select SME Assist, uh, go to the Interactive Decision Tools uh, and you'll find that tool there. Uh, again, if you do need assistance with the tool or anything uh, to do with uh, GMP requirements or TGA's manufacturing requirements, uh, you can always give us a call, send us an email um, or send your inquiry direct to the uh, GMP team. There's uh, contact details at the end of these slides. So now we'll have a look at requirements uh, around uh, from the Office of Drug Control. Uh, so the Office of Drug Control is part of the Department of Health. Uh, ODC regulates and provides advice on the import, export and manufacture of controlled drugs, as well as the cultivation of cannabis for medical purposes, uh, medicinal purposes, sorry, to support Australia's obligations under international drug conventions. So a medicinal cannabis license authorises either uh, cultivation, which is the growing of the cannabis plant, uh, or the production, uh, which is the separation of cannabis and cannabis resin, uh, or both. There are no restrictions on the number of licences that can be granted. However, under international conventions, the overall quantities produced must not ex exceed domestic requirements. So a cannabis, uh, will, We've also got uh, cannabis research licenses. So a, a cannabis research license uh, authorises the cultivation and or production of cannabis for research related to the medicinal use of cannabis. So in order to obtain a cannabis research license, an applicant will need to explain the purpose of the research and of course how it relates to medicinal cannabis and or medicinal cannabis products. In all cases, uh, the licensee will need to hold a permit issued under the Narcotic Drugs Act before any cultivation uh, or production commences. So for further information on the role of the Office of Drug Control uh, in the supply of medicinal cannabis, in Australia you can find some really helpful information on their website. Uh, so that would be uh, www.odc.gov.au. Uh, we will provide the, the links here as well, um, or by contacting uh, them uh, on the details that we provide. Now, import and export of medicinal cannabis products between countries, uh, including those made um, from, uh, sorry, low THC cannabis, uh, is tightly con controlled and subject to international drug conventions. Uh, so approval must be granted by the national governments of both the importing and exporting countries before shipment uh, can occur. Uh, so as far as import into Australia, if a medical practitioner um, considers a medicinal cannabis product suitable uh, for a particular patient, uh, they can either apply through uh, spe the special access scheme as we discussed earlier, uh, or the authorised prescriber scheme. So these uh, schemes do relate to uh, unapproved therapeutic goods. Now, if we have a look at uh, the export uh, of therapeutic goods, provided the domestic supply of medicinal cannabis isn't affected, uh, some products are eligible for export if a license and a permit to export are granted. So here we're looking at things um, like uh, Australian manufactured medicinal cannabis products that are manufactured under a GMP license. Um, also medicinal cannabis products that are listed as export only um, or registered on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods or ARTG. So extracts of cannabis or um, Extracts of cannabis resin uh, manufactured under a Narcotic Drugs Act of 1967 license and permit uh, that are not in the form of a finished product uh, may also be eligible. Uh, so, so really, if the product doesn't appear on the ARTG, either as uh, an export only or registered medicine, um, or a license and permit to export the drug hasn't been issued by the Office of Drug Control, it wouldn't be permitted for export. Now, uh, if we look at wholesale, a person who supplies uh, unregistered medicinal cannabis products by wholesale 
uh, is likely to contravene the Therapeutic Goods Act of 1989. So those contraventions may result in a regulatory action under the Therapeutic Goods Act and can also have implications for licenses issued under the Narcotic Drugs Act. So um, customs that prohibited imports regulations and also state and territory legislation. So um, it's important to um, have a look at the information that we do have available on our website uh, around supply and wholesaling of medicinal, medicinal cannabis products. Now, um, if we move on to supply, so sponsors can submit an application to include Schedule 4 CBD preparations in the ARTG, uh, which are regulated as prescription medicines. Uh, applications are individually evaluated for safety, quality and efficacy and must meet all legislative requirements for therapeutic goods as set out in the applicable legislation. So information on the application process and data requirements is available in the Australian regulatory guidelines for prescription medicines. Uh, and currently there are only two products approved. So I'm now going to hand you over to Clara Kohlmeyer from our prescription medicines team to briefly take you through the application process. Over to you, Clara. Hi, thanks, Steve. You can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Thank you. So I will be talking about the prescription medicines registration process, which outlines um, a number of different processes for prescription medicines. Uh, we have different application types, different categories, uh, and they are all, all fairly detailed. So as Steve had mentioned, you can refer to the uh, Australian regulatory guidelines for prescription medicines, or you can always contact the application entry team and myself and my team will always uh, help out with any questions if need be. So for, um, sorry, I think I've just got to sort out my slides. <laughs> um, so for um, prescription medicines, there are different pre-application activities that you may consider before applying for a prescription medicine. Uh, application to go through the process. There's um, also things to consider like the approved terminology for medicines and ingredient names. Then um, this is a requirement uh, before applying for a prescription medicine. So this will also determine the type of medicine it is, will determine the scheduling as well, and whether or not it will have to come through the prescription medicines process. Uh, there's a number of options available uh, as well, such as pre-submission meetings. So at a pre-submission meeting, um, you can discuss with the relevant clinical evaluation areas and all the other experts within our branch uh, about your proposed pathway forward and if you've got any questions before you actually uh, put in an application. Um, all of our prescription medicine applications will require a product information document to be submitted or a draft PI at the time until it is approved, a uh, consumer medicine information document as well. And then towards uh, you would also need to consider patent certification uh, information and data exclusivity. So data exclusivity, uh, for a new chemical entity is uh, outlined in section 25A of the Therapeutic Goods Act, and it does talk about a five-year data, exclusi uh, data exclusivity period uh, from the registration of the new chemical entity. Um, the patent certification is um, required at the end of the process before the product is actually put on the ARTG, and that's outlined in section 26B of the Therapeutic Goods Act. Um, but again, um, I know these are all, um, you know, a lot of detail to take uh, on board. So yes, please do contact us for more information, uh, especially about pre-submission meetings and any pre-application requirements. So the different categories that we have within prescription medicines is uh, category one applications. They're our highest application category. And category one applications do contain a number of different application types within that category. So the highest one being a new chemical entity or a new biological medicine uh, application. And then we can go into uh, an application type for an extension of indications. So if you already have a medicine on the RTG, 
and you wish to extend the indications for that medicine, then that's our next highest category. Uh, we also then have major variations where you may want to register a new strength uh, or, you know, um, consider a new dose form, um, all of these um, are category one submission applications and even things such as uh, changes to the clinical aspects of the product information document may require uh, category one submission to be submitted. So category one submission does require clinical evaluation uh, and at times toxicology and quality information and that's why they have the uh, longer uh, statutory time frame of 255 working days, which is legislated. Um, but then we can also consider a uh, comparable overseas regulator uh, category, which may reduce the time frame. Um, if, um, and I'll, I'll move on to the next slides to actually detail that process a bit more, but it may reduce the legislated time frames down to 120 working days. Uh, category three applications and minor variations are usually a standard 45 working day legislated timeframe. And um, just as the name uh, implies, the minor variations, it's minor changes to your registered good. Uh, category three applications may be things like, you know, changes to shelf life and manufacturer information, for example, and do not have clinical or toxicology data. Um, so the statutory processing times are outlined in the regulations and that's why, why they are um, legislated timeframes. Um, I've already uh, mentioned the different application types that we have for our category one submissions. So these are some of them just outlined on the slide. Um, and, and even things like new generic medicines are incorporated within our CAP1 applications, um, as long as uh, you're able to provide bioavailability bio data um, and all of the required information for a new generic medicine. Um, the key phases and milestones for a Category 1 application is we have a pre-submission stage and this is different to a pre-submission meeting. So a pre-submission meeting occurs outside any of the application processes, whereas the pre-submission stage is what uh, generates and initiates your application. So this is what is required. So once you've um, actually registered as a sponsor and you have your client ID, you can get, then go onto the TBS portal and submit a pre-submission application um, and follow the processes at that stage. Uh, with a pre-submission application, it is mainly just to generate the submission number on our workflow system. And then the next step, the submission step, is where the dossier is provided. And the dossier is what includes all of the required information uh, that we need to determine whether or not your application is actually acceptable for evaluation. So this is just that determination stage to determine whether or not we will accept the application for evaluation. The rest of the steps then are what happens throughout the evaluation process. We may reach out and ask Section 31 questions uh, and then um, follow the process through to the TGA decision and then the administrative aspects of the post-decision process and writing the product onto the RTG if uh, the evaluation or the product is approved. So this is the comparative overseas regulator applications, um, which, which we used to call category two submissions. They ha may have a reduced time frame of 120 working days or 175 working days, depending on what part of the criteria you can meet. There is certain criteria that you do have to meet, such as that the application must be exactly the same in the comparable overseas regulators as well. So uh, we've got the countries listed on the slide um, that um, we do accept evaluation reports from. And um, but the criteria doesn't stop there. The criteria means that the same application should have been submitted and the same evaluation must have been completed by those regulators. Um, so they, they're not very common, but they are becoming a lot more common as we start working closer with our overseas counterparts. Um, criteria for uh, full submissions. 
uh, is that it should be a category one submission. Um, this criteria does not apply for uh, any of our minor variations. Um, so, uh, over the last few years, we have been trying to streamline our processes and trying to, you know, minimize the 255 working day time frame. And as a result, we've introduced a number of um, various pathways to accompany our cap one application and core application pathways. So the priority review pathway does allow for a faster assessment of uh, eligible prescription medicines. But there is a determination step that is required prior to submitting an application. And that this step also requires an application through uh, our TB's portal. And there is a very strict criteria that the sponsor would have to meet to be able to receive a priority determination application. If priority determination is granted, then you may proceed with your category one submission with that priority pathway and the time frames, evaluation time frames will be significantly reduced. Um, as a result, we've also introduced the provisional approval pathways, which allows the sponsors to apply for time limited provisional registration on the RTG. So the time frame is specific, and eventually, um, after a number of years and extensions, if possible. Uh, you will be able to submit all of the data required to have the product uh, fully registered on the RTG. So there is always a transition from the provisional to full, but the provisional um, pathway does provide earlier access to certain promising new medicines. And again, it does require the determination step um, prior to submitting the category one submission. And it does uh, have an even stricter criteria uh, where uh, our team of clinical experts within our prescription medicines authorization branch will assess all of the determinations for provisional uh, applications submitted to us and uh, make sure that all of the eligibility criteria are met before the provisional approval is provided. Um, there's also uh, requirements and the way we deal with our dossiers. Um, because they are very complex and uh, they do need to, the, our evaluation areas need to know where to find specific information. We do specify and require that all of our applications, dossiers are submitted in the common technical document format and that they do um, meet all of the general dossier requirements. Up until um, recently, or we are still accepting NICE, non-ECTD uh, submissions to the TGA, but please know that this is very quickly becoming um, uh, transitioning to full ECTD requirements. And all of those requirements, they are very detailed. Again, uh, there's links on our website provided, but if you do have any questions, do reach out and we will um, you know, explain uh, anything at all. But basically the ECTD uh, common technical requirements do specify that there's certain modules that you have to provide and each one of those modules determines what type of application is within those modules. So for example, module one will have all your administrative aspects, whereas module three will have all your quality information and then module five will be your clinical information. But as I said, this is all specified in the common technical uh, data requirements. So for more information on our, uh, or rather there's more information on our uh, website and there's quite a bit of information um, and especially with the introduction of our new provisional and priority uh, determination pathways in our orphan criteria, um, you know, it's probably best just to refer to all of these uh, links. And then if you don't understand any of those aspects, do reach out to the application entry team and uh, we'll, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, so I guess, yes, the final hints and tips is just to ensure and check that your product is a, a therapeutic order, like a Schedule 4 for a prescription medicine, for example. Um, decide whether you want to have it approved in your name to supply in Australia, because if this is the case, then uh, you must be a registered client within our uh, client database. 
Uh, and also note that you would have all regulatory activity responsibilities for that product once it is on the RTG and obviously throughout the evaluation process. Um, so yes, understanding the legal requirements um, for the product and your legal responsibilities. Um, and basically, yeah, determining if it meets a particular submission pathway and application type, that can often be uh, a bit, little bit complicated. And we do receive a lot of inquiries through the application entry inbox um, about whether or not a particular submission um, pathway is appropriate and what the application type should be. And we do encourage sponsors before they submit the actual application through the portal to discuss um, whether or not this is the right application with us. Uh, as we would like to ensure the smooth transition of any application processing for both sides. Um, I think that's at the end of it, we will publish the what we call the OSPA, which provides uh, a summary of the submission and the TGA's evaluation of the company data submitted. So the considerations and what, it, what led to the decision making process for the TGA to approve or not approve an application. So we may have um, OSPARs on the system as well for rejected goods, um, but there is a lot of um, negotiation that goes on with our sponsors in relation to this. But yes, one thing to consider is just that the OSPAR is what we call a summary of the evaluation process. It obviously doesn't detail the whole um, evaluation pathway. Um, and I think that's um, me done, Steve. Yes. Yeah, thank you for that, Clara. It was really great. Um, okay, so uh, now we're going to have a look at uh, supply of medicinal cannabis as an over-the-counter medicine. So just a bit of background. On the 15th of December 2020, a final decision uh, was made to downschedule uh, certain low dose cannabidiol or CBD preparations uh, from Schedule 4, which is a prescription medicine, uh, to Schedule 3, which is a pharmacist only medicine. So the final decision uh, was that low dose CBD products uh, containing up to a maximum of 150 milligrams per day uh, and a use uh, for use in adults 18 years and over uh, and uh, used in oral mucosal and sublingual preparations uh, that are packed in blister or strip packaging uh, or in a container with child resistant closures uh, and containing no more than 30 days supply in a pack uh, and that meets specified formulation requirements uh, in that this the cannabidiol uh, that is either plant derived uh, or when uh, synthetic again as we discussed a little bit earlier only contains that uh, certain um, CBD uh, enantiomer, uh, uh, and it also contains uh, can cannabidiol that uh, comprises of 20, uh, sorry, 98 percent or more of the total cannabinoid content of the preparation. So any um, cannabinoids other than cannabidiol in these preparations must be those that are only naturally found in cannabis uh, and can only comprise of 2 percent or less of the total cannabinoid uh, content of the preparation. Uh, and of which uh, tetrahydrocannabinol or THC can only comprise of 1% um, of the total cannabinoid content. Uh, and those products would need to be approved by the TGA uh, and included on the ARTG. So those products, um, as per that determination, can be supplied uh, as over-the-counter uh, medicines by a pharmacist without a prescription. Uh, so it is important to note that there are there may be other requirements set out in legislation, uh, including complying with advertising requirements uh, and displaying any required warning statements uh, on packaging as well. So I'm now going to hand you over to Kevin Eager from our over-the-counter medicines uh, space uh, to take you through the application process for over-the-counter medicines. So over to you, Kevin. Okay, thanks, Steve. Okay, in order to get an OTC medicine registered on the ARTG, a sponsor must submit an application to the TGA. 
there, there are various application levels to register a new OTC medicine, ranging in complexity from the N1 application pathway at the most simple level to N5 at the highest or the most complex level. An application to register an OTC CBD medicine needs to come in at the N5 application level. Now these are non-generic medicines and are fully evaluated for safety, efficacy and quality. There are guidance documents on the TGA website specific for OTC medicines which detail the application process, application formatting requirements and data requirements. So the data are provided in CTD format. As Clara said, that's the common technical document format. Guidance on the format of an application is included on the TGA website. In summary, the data are provided in five modules. Modules one and two comprise the administrative um, and the summary admin and the summary data. Module three includes the quality data. Now, an important point to note here, in addition to the usual OTC um, module three data requirements, which are outlined on the website, CBD applications, along with many other N5 level applications, will also require, be required to include a module 3.2.S component, or if, managed, or if the product is manufactured, the, the drug substance is manufactured by a third party, um, then a DMF, which is a drug master file. This provides important information on the drug substance itself, such as information on the manufacture of the substance, classification and stability. Um, the module four data, the module four um, includes the non-clinical data. Um, that includes toxicology data and pharmacokinetic data. The module five includes the clinical data. Now the clinical data on the formulation proposed for marketing in Australia is expected. This should also include a do or include, include dose ranging studies to identify the minimum, minimum effective dose, which is specified for your product and specific for the therapeutic indication. Due to the lack of high quality published trials, any literature submitted as part of an application is likely to be supportive at best. Further, the relevance of the studies in the literature to the proposed product would need to be demonstrated. All literature searches must be systematic searches. There's guidance on the TGA website um, on conducting a literature search. The data supporting the safety and efficacy of the product must be relevant to the proposed therapeutic indications, the patient population and the proposed dosage. The therapeutic indication, including any claims made on the labelling of the, of the product, must be suitable for a pharmacist consultation. Therapeutic indications for a serious medical condition, such as epilepsy, depression, anxiety disorders, etc., that require ongoing monitoring or advice from a doctor are not appropriate for an OTC medicine. Sponsors are expected to follow the EU, the relevant EU guidelines and the ICH guideline documents, and of course, the Australian regulatory guidelines for OTC medicines. Um, links to all of these guidance document, documents can be found on the TGA website. And that's it for me. I think it's over to Melanie. Or maybe Steve. Thank you for that, Kevin. Just bear with me a moment. I just need to get my slides here. Okay, so we'll just take a, a brief look now at advertising when it comes to supplying medicinal cannabis products um, or therapeutic goods in general. Uh, so advertising requirements um, apply to all therapeutic goods, uh, although some medicines such as prescription medicines and biologicals uh, do have requirements that mean they can't be uh, advertised to consumers. So it's important to be aware that advertising is considered any promotional material at all, 
Uh, so that can include, but not it is not limited to uh, things like medicine labels, um, including packaging, uh, TV advertisements, uh, websites, including social media sites, uh, and potentially um, endorsement and social media sites and comments as well. Um, now, advertising is regulated by the Therapeutic Goods Act of 1989 uh, and the Therapeutic Goods Regulations uh, of 1990, as well as the Therapeutic Goods Advertising Code. Now, there are certain circumstances uh, when a good can't be advertised to the public. So you can see some of uh, the restrictions here on this slide. Uh, so these do include, but aren't again limited to, pharmacist only medicines, uh, except for those that are included in Appendix H of the Poison Standard. Uh, it includes uh, prescription medicines. Uh, so if we're looking at prescription medicines, of course, we're looking at things that appear in schedules uh, four or eight of the Poison Standard, as we discussed earlier. Um, also prohibited or restricted representations, uh, unless pre uh, prior approval from the TGA uh, has been granted. Uh, also advertising to health professionals uh, and advertising for health services. So we do on uh, the SME Assist hub of the TGA website, uh, have a, another handy decision tool. Uh, it's called, can I advertise this therapeutic good to the public? Uh, so it's a decision tool and also, um, sorry, a decision tool that'll help you make that determination. If you are supplying a therapeutic good uh, and you're not too sure about whether or not you can advertise it, jump onto the TGA website. Uh, do have a look at that tool, uh, go through, it'll ask you a series of questions uh, and at the end of that, it'll provide you some guidance. Uh, if you're still unsure at that point, uh, please again, feel free to, to give us a call here uh, or drop us an email. Uh, so we do have uh, contact details uh, at the end of the slides here today. Uh, you should all have received a copy uh, of the slides by now, but if you haven't, uh, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, just provide your email address uh, and I can get those out to you. Now, just back to uh, advertising here, while there are um, advertising restrictions that do apply to therapeutic goods, uh, there might be circumstances in which the advertising uh, of these goods might be permitted. So, for example, in the interest of public health, uh, as, as an example of this, in 2019, uh, the TGA did authorise uh, advertisements for vaccines uh, that are or form part of uh, the Commonwealth or state and territory health campaigns. So we regulate advertising uh, because not only can a false claim be misleading to the public, uh, it can also be really unsafe. Uh, so it's important that we do um, regulate and monitor advertising of therapeutic goods. Uh, so the advertising code applies to all therapeutic goods to varying degrees. Uh, it does outline key requirements uh, that must be met when advertising to the public. So uh, do make sure that you jump on and familiarise yourself with this uh, piece of legislation uh, and understand what you can and cannot do when it comes to advertising therapeutic goods. Uh, so that advertising code is available uh, on the advertising hub on the TGA website. Uh, again, if you're having any trouble with it or, or need any assistance, uh, you can give us a call, drop us an email, uh, or you can submit uh, an inquiry through uh, the advertising uh, compliance hub as well. So if you do have specific questions uh, relating to advertising, you can also contact the advertising team uh, using the details that we'll provide uh, on a later slide. Uh, you can contact them directly. There is the advertising inquiries um, uh, option on the advertising uh, compliance hub as well. Uh, so I'd, I highly recommend you have a look at that. Um, but again, you can always pick up the phone and give us a call. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this section. I'm now just going to hand you back to, to Rachel uh, for some housekeeping uh, before we take a break. Thanks, Stephen. It's a lot to get through, isn't it? A lot to take in. So I'm just going to go through some um, basic information that may be of assistance to you. Um, 
So my name is Rachel, I'm from the TGO Conferencing and Events. I'm also part of the SME Assist team. So this is the SME Assist website that Stephen had mentioned earlier on and which I believe I provided to you in the link. There is the phone number there. We are actual people on behind, behind that 1800 number. So um, don't be afraid to give that one a call. Social media slides. Are you aware that we're on the, the Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, topic blogs, LinkedIn and Instagram? There's all the information there for those and I will send those out into the slide, um, out into the chat function a little later as well. Some of the important contact information you might find that you'd like to have close by and handy. We have our TGA info line, our over the counter medicine email address, our prescription branch medicines email for application entries, and the Office of Drug Control, advertising team for any of your advertising inquiries, and the unapproved products additional cannabis email address there.